Good evening. On behalf of KPCC and the Planetary Society, welcome to Caltech's Beckman Auditorium for Destined to Crash, Cassini's grand finale. Thank you to all of our members for making tonight's event and all of our programming possible. We truly couldn't do it without your generous support. Now, if you're not a member, you can always call 866-888-5722 or click and join at kpcc.org. We will be audio recording and live video streaming tonight's program, so please silence your devices. Phone, tablet, pager, rover, spacecraft. And kindly refrain from any kind of recording, because if you don't, we'll send Bill Nye and Larry Mantle after you. If you manage to sneak any candies in, please, please unwrap them now. In case of an emergency, please take a moment to identify the exit nearest to you. Now, we know there are a lot of NASA and JPL types in the auditorium tonight, but in most cases, these will be landbound exit ways. Thank you again for joining us as we take a look back at Cassini's mission and grand finale. Five, four, three, two, one, and liftoff of the Cassini spacecraft on a billion mile trek to Saturn. It was a tremendous, very exciting feeling to watch Cassini lift up off the launch pad, feeling the roar of the rockets. You see it before you feel it, and then watching Cassini go through a cloud. And the Cassini spacecraft is on its way to Saturn. The cloud brightens up, and you kind of <gasps> hold your breath. Out, Cassini comes out the top of the cloud on its way to Saturn. And with a mission like Cassini, you answer a whole list of questions. And in the process of answering those questions, you might generate 10 more questions for every question you answer. The more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. We knew Enceladus was weird. We knew that something good was happening there. We didn't know what. Because it's as bright as freshly fallen snow. It's this winter wonder world, and we didn't understand why. On the Earth, we have mountains made out of rock. On Titan, the mountains are made out of water ice. And around the entire equator is nothing but dunes as far as the eye can see. And they're dunes just like the dunes of the Arabian Desert, but they're made out of little chips of water. We wonder, could life have started in another world, you know, in an ocean underneath a thick, icy crust? It was, I think, the greatest discovery I could have been involved in. It's going to be sad. Just like people die, we feel this is a living entity. It really is losing the family. And we feel that when it finally crashes into Saturn, it's like losing a close colleague. And so when that, that connection is cut with Cassini's final heartbeat, we'll lose that intimate personal connection to the Saturn system. And now, your hosts for the evening, Planetary Radio's Matt Kaplan and KPCC's Jacob Margolis. Hi, everybody. Hey, Matt, how you doing? Hey, I'm great. All right. Exciting night. It is an exciting night. Got a full house. Oh, we got a lot of good-looking people. Yeah. And so everyone's here. I know you're here. It's a, it's a memorial of sorts, right, as we saw, you know, on Friday, Cassini, the much-beloved spacecraft, plunged to her death in Saturn's atmosphere. <laughs> but, but, with apologies to Shakespeare, we come not to mourn Cassini, but to praise her. Long, Long live, live Cassini! Cassini. <laughs> Tonight we have quite a show for you. We're going to go on an adventure through space, nearly a billion miles away, to the second largest planet in our solar system. Saturn. And as you know, we're going to hear all about the little spacecraft that could. It has taught us the majority of what we now know about that giant ring planet 
uh, the one that many believe is the most beautiful in our neighborhood, and it has now been revealed as never before. And it's not just the planet, of course, but its vast system of moons and rings. I'll be walking the audience through NASA's exploration of the Saturn system over the last 40 plus years, even a little bit more. Uh, actually, most of that research was led by folks right in our own backyard at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is pretty cool. And I'll be interviewing one of those scientists along with two of the mission team leaders who have enabled Cassini to do its work for so many years. And we're going to bring them out right now. Please welcome to the stage Cassini project scientist, Linda Spilker, Cassini program manager, Earl Mays, and Cassini spacecraft operations manager, Julie Webster. Okay, there is uh, one more person joining us, my Planetary Society colleague, senior editor, Emily Locke Wallace. She's here in part to represent the scores of citizen scientists who have contributed to this mission. Emily Locke Wallace. So, welcome everyone, and congratulations. I was here Friday morning <laughs> before 5 a.m., about 4 a.m., for that glorious, bittersweet finish, uh, and then ran over to uh, JPL to be with, well, Emily and Jacob were there for the press conference. It was one of the greatest mornings of, I have to say, of my life. Um, we have so much to talk about in limited time, but let's begin with this. For the benefit of the one or two people in this very sophisticated audience who don't remember or know why, why did we crash Cassini? Earl. Well, we, we really didn't. It's, it's been the plan for seven years, and really the reason was to use every possible piece of that spacecraft in the most optimal scientific way possible. We couldn't leave Cassini floating around derelict around Saturn. It was you know, because of the uh, potential prebiotic nature of both Titan and uh, Enceladus, particularly Enceladus. We couldn't contaminate it, so we had to rid, you know, put the spacecraft away. The idea was to use all the fuel and go out in a blaze of glory getting Saturn science for the very last second. And that's exactly what happened, right? That's I mean, you correct. You were getting data Absolutely. right to the very yeah, end. Right to the very end. Um, all of you, all three of you, have been with this mission for so many years. Linda, for you, for what, almost 30 years? Almost 30 years, almost a whole Saturn year. <laughs> 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 you gotta ask, how does it feel to be really at the end of an era? Julie? Well, I, you know, it's, it's amazing, but it's exactly what Earl said. You know, we, we did it. We, we designed it. We, we knew that this day would come nine years ago. It w it's everything that we expected it to be, and, and it was time. It, we were starting to worry about things going, going wrong. Mm. Uh, you were all together, most of you were together for so, such a long time. Did it start to feel like a family? Oh, absolutely. I think we got to know each other really well. In some cases, our kids grew up together. We'd take vacations together, go out to dinner, and really got to know each other as people and not just professionals. Yeah, couldn't, couldn't agree more. We uh, would finish each other's sentences, take care of dog sit for each other. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was very, very much a family. and. Um, the entire, you know, and, and the entire set of skills and personalities that you expect in a large extended family. It's not like we always got along all the time, but that's what <laughs> families do. <laughs> Was it, I mean, there were a couple of references at the press conference to uh, that old, old scientists versus uh, engineers uh, uh, discussion, <laughs> <Yeah>. right, Julie? <laughs> that's why Earl's in the that's middle. That's why I'm in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> that's, wh that's why you said, so. you know, it, it's yeah. like my mother separated my sisters in church even when we were adults. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, well, we did, but uh, Linda, Linda's going to give you my, my final line to all the scientists was uh, we were there for the science. Absolutely. And when Julie said that, it just melted my heart. It was great. Yeah. And, and, and you know, she got 23 times past Enceladus, so we, we worked our way in. We started way far on thrusters and worked our way in slowly but surely and just knew that there wasn't, you know, anything. So we didn't take any chances with Cassini. 
um, but we did, we did. You push the envelope once pushed, or twice. Right. Oh, absolutely, yeah. or yeah. half dozen, absolutely. a dozen times. Yeah, that tension times. between engineering and science is what really makes you get the absolute most out of the mission. When everyone's asking for a little bit more than they probably can get and saying, or someone's saying, well, you can't quite get as much as you're asking for, but I'll give you a little bit more than I said. <laughs> that, that balance is what I think Cassini will, will take as a takeaway as one of the big successes, is to find the right sweet spot between science and engineering. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely true. We know data came right to the end. Images yes. did not. We have, I think, the very last image captured by the spacecraft, and you've got it in front of you on that monitor at the uh, lip of the stage there. Linda, do you recognize it? What are we looking at? We're looking at Saturn, and basically that dark shadowed line is uh, probably just above the equator, and it's actually illuminated in wind shine. And in mm. that picture is the place that Cassini finally plunged. And so it was very bittersweet to capture that image and know that somewhere in there, there's a little piece of Cassini. Is this also a scientifically significant image? Yes, you can look and study the clouds right till the very end. We've been looking at seasonal change on Saturn for almost two Saturn seasons. So scientifically interesting as well. We have one of your favorite images from the mission that we're going to pop up now. It's also one of my favorites. I had this on the back of my business card for years, uh, but the resolution wasn't high enough to really see what's going on here. So talk about it. This is a wonderful image. Basically, you're looking at the sun in eclipse, this, in this case, by Saturn. And you can see all of the rings. The sunlight is shining through the tiniest particles, much, li much like if you have a dusty windshield and it's hard to see when you drive into the sun. I like it because you can see all of Saturn's rings in one image. And as Emily pointed out, if you look at that bright ring around Saturn, it's the sunlight being refracted through the atmosphere. And you're looking at every sunrise and every sunset at the same time. And that, that's just amazing. And you'll notice that the night side of Saturn is illuminated. That light from the rings is actually falling on the night side and is brightening it. And if you look very carefully, there are three other planets. So this is the, the Saturn view of the Earth and Moon system and also Venus and Mars. What was really special about this opportunity is that we reached out to the public and said, OK, there'll be a 20-minute window this was in July, I think, 2013. A 20-minute window, go out, wave at Saturn. And, and we have a pictures. Here you go. <laughs> Here we, as everybody at JPL, uh, I love the hula hoop crowd for the ring tribute, of course. It was, it was so wonderful. And then we asked people, send us your selfies. Because, you know, you're going you're to be kind of small. The Earth's only like maybe a pixel or two across. So we took all of these selfies and put them together and recreated that mosaic that you just saw. And so we have, uh, I think, with the next image with those selfies. You oh, I don't think we have Oh, that. we don't have it. OK. No, OK, sorry. well, we recreated that, that beautiful image on the selfies. And it was so wonderful. It was one of our most popular images because people were going through trying to find themselves <laughs> in that particular <laughs> image. And I did the same thing. Where am I? Where am I in that picture? Yeah. I think somebody did the math to calculate the likelihood that a photon from a waving person's <laughs> hand would have appeared in the image that Cassini took. And it was something like if you stood out there for the whole 20 minutes, like there was a one in five chance that a photon from your hand would have actually reached Saturn for that picture. <laughs> Not bad. I'll take that. <laughs> okay. I was waving really hard, so maybe I got two photons. Um, we have so much more to cover tonight. Uh, and it's going to be an interesting evening as it is punctuated by these, I think you'll agree, marvelous presentations um, that, that Jacob has for us. It has obviously been a long, long journey to this celebration tonight. Jacob, give us some context. All right, today we're going to hear all about the triumphs, the discoveries, and enduring mysteries that came up during Cassini's mission to Saturn. But before we go over what we've learned, let's go back to humanity's first encounter with the planet. Before the crash, before Cassini, before NASA, even before the United States, there was a guy named Galileo. You've heard of him. He was the first to observe Saturn through a telescope in 1610. But Galileo didn't see a ring. 
he actually described the planet as having handles. Of course, that's because his telescope was maybe not as advanced as ours today. Uh, it wasn't until later that century that Dutch astronomer Christian Huygens proposed a crazy idea, that the planet was actually surrounded by a giant ring. But it wasn't until the 1700s that an Italian astronomer, and you might recognize this name, Giovanni Cassini, figured out that what they were looking at wasn't one big ring, but of multiple rings. Now, let's take a big jump. We're going to go to the 1980s, because that's when one of our biggest sets of discoveries about Saturn came from JPL. These people here in Mission Control were responsible for guiding NASA's 1,800-pound unmanned Voyager 1 spacecraft some billion miles through space. Driven by our curiosity of the cosmos, we launched space probes deep into the solar system. They, of course, were Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. And after quite a long journey, they arrived at Saturn. Because of human ingenuity, we saw our clearest photos to date of the gas giant, its many moons, and its thousands of glorious rings, largely made up of little chunks of ice. Truly, the veil had been lifted in unprecedented detail of the outer reaches of our solar system. So, what was the reaction from the science community and, and the Voyager mission team when, when those close-ups from Voyager of Saturn started to, to flood in? Linda, I know you were on the, you were still with, with the, were you on Cassini by that time? or No, you must have still been on Voyager. I was on Voyager at that point in time. And I, for me, as a ring scientist, I remember that there was some thinking that the rings would be these bland, sheets of material, and as we got closer and closer, this incredible detail looking like the grooves on a phonograph record, and it was just astonishing to see that detail, and these little moons that had been points of light, bit by bit, we started to reveal and better understand what they look like. So it was amazing to be on Voyager and be one of those early explorers. Earl, was the inspiration provided by Voyager, was that partly a driving force of wanting to get back to Saturn with Cassini? Oh, absolutely. I think that the, the Voyager, as, as has Cassini, raises, as, raised as many questions as discoveries. And of course, we had to go back. And I think it was also part of the, the campaign that NASA had put together of these reconnaissance missions following on the, on the uh, heels of the flyby missions. Galileo did that at Jupiter. And Cassini it was lo the logical uh, next. Saturn was the next logical target. We still have a couple of uh, large bodies to go yet, but that was <laughs> no doubt that Voyager is showing us these m planets and, and mysteries that we just simply have to go back and explore further. Well, I think in particular was the moon Titan. One of Voyager One's key goals was to fly close to Titan and see what its surface looked like. And instead, all that Voyager 1 saw was this ball of photochemical haze smog. And so immediately after the Voyager flybys, scientists started to get together and said, let's go back. Titan is still a key objective. Let's go back with a probe, with radar to pierce through the haze. Let's go back and study Titan. Now, I was five years old when, the Voy when Voyager flew past Saturn for the first time, so I don't remember the actual flyby happening, but I do remember a Time Life book I had on our solar system. And I remember reading and seeing the names of all these wonderful different looking moons. There was Enceladus with funky looking craters and Dione with wispy terrain and, uh, all, and Rhea and all these different icy moons, all these names that were not the names of the planets that I was familiar with. And I've been fascinated with those ever since I was little. Julie did the success of Voyager support help out with the design and, and building of Cassini? I mean, were you able to take lessons from its success? Oh, absolutely. We took from the Voyager uh, more, more some of the failures of, huh. of the, yeah, and the Galileos and the Magellans and the thermal design. And in JPL up until Cassini had a thing about this, the people did the same job kind of over and over. So you had an amazing amount of experience on the floor uh, building in and testing Galileo. I just want to add one picture about the the backlit picture, one comment. Sure. As an engineer, th what I see is the multiple images and how stable that spacecraft <laughs> is. <laughs> <laughs> there must be some engineers in the audience. <laughs> I, can we get an idea right now? If you're a Cassini team member, give a shout. Anybody. Or anybody from JPL? Okay. 
Well, so. congratulations to you too. Emily, briefly. But speaking of Voyager inspiration and Voyager leading to Cassini, I know that there are actually spare parts from Voyager that were included in Cassini. Yeah. Julie? It's, it's actually not spare parts, but the same design. We had the same, we had the same basic thrusters as Voyager did. And, and our main engine, the thing that was the big engine, was from, uh, was up thrusters Apollo. on Apollo. Oh, so so we, had a, we had a lot, we had a, uh, com a computer that was an upgraded version of Magellan and Galileo. But the thermal design, I think, has always been one of my favorites, mm. that it was, it was such an incredible, you know, the, the spacecraft ran at room temperature, basically from Venus to Saturn. And Cassini's camera optics actually had some Voyager parts uh, included in it. Right, and some of the other <laughs> instruments are basically upgrades to the Voyager instruments. The composite infrared spectrometer is based on a Voyager instrument, just mm -hmm. better detectors. So if it ain't broke. That's right. Um, That's right. Clearly the pictures and other data from Voyager whetted everyone's appetite because scientists and engineers at NASA spent the next decade figuring out how to get back to Saturn. It was the 1980s, and JPL scientists, like Linda Spilker, hi Linda Spilker, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> we're excited to get back to Saturn, but space is hard. The vision wasn't easy to execute. It was going to cost a lot of money. There were arguments over what instruments should go on the spacecraft and what route they should take to get there. Twice, Congress threatened to cut funding, and on top of all that, there was this public uproar over the nuclear fuel source that if it exploded, people were really, really worried that it would contaminate Cape Canaveral. But luckily, in 1997, it happened. And liftoff of the Cassini spacecraft on a billion mile trek to Saturn. Cassini launched with far better cameras or with some of the parts uh, from Voyager, with instruments that could help her measure chemical compositions, atmospheres, molecules floating through space. And traveling at tens of thousands of miles per hour, Cassini departed through the Earth's atmosphere, beyond our moon, Mars, Jupiter, and after seven years, 2004, she arrived at Saturn. There was a lot about the gas giant that we still didn't know. For instance, we didn't and don't uh, know the exact length of a Saturn day. We needed to test our understanding of what Saturn was made of. And we weren't sure of the origin or age of the planet's rings. Also perplexing were the massive storms that engulfed large swaths of the planet for months at a time. Oh, and I mean, let's talk about this hexagonal, uh, giant, stormy hexagon on the North Pole, because I'm not sure how weather can have six-sided geometry, but, you know, with a hurricane eye at the center, which is really nuts, uh, the more data scientists sifted through and the more Cassini circled the planet, even more questions everyone had. And there was a long way to go to better understand the basics of Saturn, even though we've been looking at it for more than 400 years. So we didn't have to wait for orbital insertion for science uh, from Cassini. How early in the mission did useful data start to uh, arrive back here uh, on Earth? Linda? I think probably maybe six months, maybe a bit more, we started taking pictures of Saturn. and Six Saturn months out from Saturn? From, from Saturn orbit insertion. And we, we saw this little tiny planet, and it slowly grew bigger and bigger and saw more detail in the rings, and we thought we're going to take a whole lot of science going in just in case something happens at Saturn orbit insertion. Mm -hmm. There was uh, an interesting, talking about engineering and science often in conflict, there was a very wonderful symbiosis between the two. We had to test the motor before we went and did the Saturn orbit insertion burn. So the best way to do that was to make sure that we had something on the order of 50 or so meters per second to test out the entire propulsion system before we went into orbit. Well, it turns out if you put that 50 meters in the right place, there's this captured Kuiper belt object out there waiting for you called Phoebe. So we actually had our first close flyby was before Saturn orbit insertion. We did a test burn afterwards to go back in towards, and that was Phoebe. You remember that? It was just a beautiful object. And again, for the sake of engineering, we did science <laughs> at Jupiter. <laughs> we had this and wonderful Venus and, Venus. <laughs> and Venus and Venus, but always for engineering. This was not uh, the science objectives. The uh, we'd been we launched Cassini without all the capabilities to do operations at Saturn, 
and Julie's crew spent the entire, our crew actually at oh, the time, yeah. spent the, the, uh, those seven years developing the capabilities and we tested them all out at Jupiter and Galileo was still there. So we had an inside outside uh, campaign at Jupiter uh, with Cassini surfing in and out of the magnetic field while Galileo was propelling around inside. It's beautiful. We have an iconic image of, of Jupiter that we're still very proud of. So we actually, Saturn science was turned on six months early, but you know, it, the camel snuck its nose under the tent. <laughs> at <laughs> Venus. A yeah. lot yeah. sooner. <laughs> well, as soon as we launched, yeah. you know, Earl and I were planning to fly a rock. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> which, which has always been the joke. Uh -huh. And as soon as we knew that we had a good spacecraft and there were no issues, the scientists started clamoring. But remember the first two, three years, we had to go to Venus, back to Venus, and then by Earth. So uh, the high gain antenna, which was our main communications, was used as a sun shield. So we, did, we had very, very low bit rates. And we didn't turn the high gain back to use it as a communication device until 2000. I, I'm going to throw this in. Did you have to use, because of that huge high gain antenna, did you, uh, using it as a heat shield, did you have to, as you navigated, take that into account with the solar wind and just the light of the sun? It all, oh, it everything. all had to be considered, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And the heat from the RTGs and the, in the, in the solar pressure and the pressure. The, the mag boom wasn't out until after we went past Earth. But yeah, mm. all of that had to be taken into account. And the, and the navigators were saying, you move Cassini, you move Cassini. It was like, <laughs> 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 I, I didn't. <laughs> but uh, yeah, all of that. Was, and, and it was well modeled. It was a, an amazing modeling That's some job. amazing navigators that you work with yeah. there at JPL. Really Absolutely. bright people. <laughs> so so yeah. as we're approaching Saturn, how did it feel to see that planet growing in the sky, Linda? It was tremendous for me to see it, you know, having worked on Voyager in the 1980s and then to all the way to 2004 to be back and looking at Saturn and the rings and just the, the promise of what was there. And we just had a four-year prime mission, but we had packed it full of incredible science observations. I remember the tension in the room on that July day, 2004, as we were waiting with you to see if things were going to happen right. Uh, Julie, you're nodding emphatically. <laughs> Tell us, what were we waiting for? Well, we, we tracked, um, it, the, we weren't going to get any signal back until after the, the, the engine burn was done. And in, if you remember, in 98, 99, NASA had some losses. And um, so they invoked this rule on us that said, thou shalt not do a, a critical event without telemetry. And we were not pointed at Earth to, to get down telemetry, so we had to switch to our, our low gain antenna, which was about 80, 80 degrees off Earth point, Earl? I think more 60. 60 degrees off. And so the radio science team came in and said, we can pick this signal up 10 dB out of the, uh, above the noise floor and we'll find it for you and we'll track the Doppler and be able to say that you got into orbit. So the and Doppler which indicated the change in velocity when yes. the engine came on, right? right? Yeah, we, we, we changed the velocity by 630, roughly 630 meters per second. That's a lot. It was the biggest, it was a 96 minute burn. So it was yeah, it was a big burn. If those guys hadn't figured that out, we would have been out about another 120 kilos of it, yeah. Of NASA fuel, came so. back and asked us <laughs> to meters point, per second, not kilos, yeah. to point the antenna at Earth, even though that made the the, the burn not in the right direction. That's right. And uh, I went back to NASA headquarters with uh, with Bob, Bob and yeah. and and argued that, Is that we, Bob Papalardo? No, no, Bob Mitchell, oh, no. oh, sorry. Um, who was the project manager at the time, and argued that. Uh, we could distinguish, you know, well enough without any telemetry that all we needed was the, the carrier signal and the radio science did it for us. Wow. Yeah, I remember watching that plot and there was a period of time we were behind the planet. Behind the rings. And, or behind the rings and behind watching rings, for it yeah, to pop twice. out yeah, and see were we on that plot. Yep. And sure enough, we get the signal and there it was right on the money. So Cassini settles into its new home uh, orbiting the planet. Uh, we're going to get to the, the moons and other stuff pretty soon. Were there surprises, were the revelations about Saturn and, and really the system uh, right from the start? 
I'm thinking of like that hexagonal storm that Jacob uh, is so excited about. Well, I think about the ring images that came right at orbit insertion. It was the closest that Cassini got to the rings for a very long time. And the incredible regularity of the features in the rings, but they, weren't, they also weren't um, regular, exactly spaced. They were, they were regular and diminishing in size, these waves. It was just incredible to look at. Yeah, you know, very, very beautiful. And also, the first time we saw propellers, these little objects in the rings that would try and open a gap and would make have these two arms that look like an airplane propeller. First time we saw those. And we've got, uh, next up is an image. Uh, Linda, you provided this. It's another one of your favorites. I don't know where this came in the mission, but it seems like a good time to show it. There's some incredible complexity uh, of that ring system. Yeah, this is really an amazing image that you could really only get with a spacecraft. At this point in time, the rings are edge on to the sun. So you've essentially turned off the sunlight for both sides of the rings. And you're looking for anything that sticks up above or below the rings because the sun shines in this direction, they'll cast shadows. So what you're seeing there, the bright edge is the edge of the B ring, one of Saturn's thickest rings. And at its outer edge, there are objects one or two miles in size sticking up like giant icebergs on either side, casting those long shadows that you can see uh, moving, moving downward in the screen. And, uh, and a good analogy for equinox is imagine that you're flying over the pyramids in the space station. And if you look down around noon, the shadows won't be very long. It'll be hard to see the pyramids against the sand uh, of the background there. But if you look at dawn or dusk, the equivalent of equinox, you'll see these long shadows of the pyramids in the same way. You're seeing the long shadows of the biggest particles in the rings. Mm. So just how big are the chunks in the rings? Uh, so the, the, on average, there may be only oh, half an inch or so in size, but there are some like at the edge of the B ring here that might be mountain sized. That could be many, many miles in size. You get big enough, like Pan or Daphnis, you can create a gap, actually open up a gap inside the ring. I, I try to imagine what the rings would look like if you were actually in them, and it's difficult because some, of, some parts of the ring, like the A ring, is partially uh, transparent, so maybe the particles aren't all right next to each other. But the B ring is quite opaque, which means that the particles have to be close enough to each other to overlap. I mean, I wonder as an astronaut if you could just leap from particle to particle, <laughs> just kind of jumping around inside the B rings or above them. It would be really cool. Right, especially if they're these iceberg sized objects, right. you know, that <laughs> might take you a long time to land on another one, but it would work. <laughs> so the rings, obviously, huge diameter, but one of the most amazing facts about the whole Saturnian system. The thickness of the ring system, Linda? It's only about 10 meters thick. So they're just <laughs> incredibly thin for their wide size. You could, fix, you could fit Saturn plus the rings in between the Earth and the Moon. That's how big that system is. And the next image we have, uh, <laughs> this is one of the ones that Emily has provided that we'll be looking at uh, over the next few minutes. Uh, she's worked on all of these as, a, as an image processor. Emily, what's happening? So we're looking at one of the little moonlets that's embedded in the rings, and probably it's not actually a solid object all the way through. It's probably got a nugget of something solid in the center and has a bunch of ring dust, kind of ring floof, kind of attached, just barely connected with it. And as its orbit is in precisely circular, it kind of moves in and out, and its gravity has effects on the ring particles near it, and it makes these waves, and then the waves get sheared out because objects closer to Saturn move faster. Objects farther from Saturn move slower in their orbit, so everything gets kind of twisted and spiraled as everything is, is orbiting around Saturn. And so you wind up with these scalloped shapes at the edge of the rings that just kind of wave on behind the moons and slowly die out as you go around it. And this is one of, the, I, bl I don't remember, is this Daphnis? Daphnis. This is yeah. Daphnis, so this is one of the ones that Cassini dis discovered. Mm. Um, just embedded near the very outer edge of the rings. Very briefly, what does it mean that you process this image? Well, Cassini, like most uh, spacecraft imagers, has a black and white camera that very, uh, that's designed so that each of the little pixels on its detector is basically a photon counter, and it's counting up scientific data, how many photons in a certain wavelength range struck that little spot in the detector. If you want color information, you throw a filter in front of it, so you limit the amount of the, of the different color photons that can strike the detector. To make a color image, you throw first a red filter and then a green filter and then a blue filter in front of your camera, take three pictures and, attach and stack them on each other and you can make color. The catch with Cassini is that Cassini is moving, 
The moons are moving, the ring particles are moving, and they're all moving in different directions at different rates. And so it's actually not all that easy sometimes to combine these images. So it can take a little finesse. Plus, there's a small problem of cosmic ray particles flying around all over the place, and they tend to do nasty things with the CCD detector. They make these bright streaks. So you have to do a little painting, a little cutting and pasting. This is art as much as it is science. Uh, but it's great fun because Saturn makes the greatest art to work with. So Earl, just even getting the original image, it's so much more difficult and complex than just holding up your smartphone. Well, that's exactly <laughs> right. And the spacecraft has uh, essentially has to propagate the motion of that little satellite through those rings, compensate for Saturn's motion, the ring's motions, and that little satellite's motion get those all put together and point the camera in the right place. And that's all done piece by piece. Each little piece is added onto the next piece. And it's kind of interesting because um, the first time we did this, we didn't do quite as good a job of tracking Daphnis as we would have liked, but we tracked the rings perfectly. And so the rings people were ecstatic because we got <laughs> the rings just nailed. And you can see this incredible structure in it with Daphnis off in the corner. And then we came back and, of course, got Daphnis, which blurred the rings a little bit. You can't have them both. Uh, but it's, it's incredibly, as, as Emily said, everything's moving counter to the other components. And you've got to pick the one you want and, and concentrate on it. The other thing to point out in this image is that if you look below Daphnis, you can see the image has sort of a scruffy look or a snowy look that isn't in the rest of the photo. That's not snow or static. That's actual structure in the rings that's too small for the camera to really discern. But if you were able to zoom in, you would see more different kinds of features than you could see mm. in that picture right now. We don't have another image of it, but we're coming back to that hexagonal storm. Do we understand it now? Do we know how dynamically that thing has lasted for, what, how many years, Linda? Well, so we saw with Voyager in the 1980s, it's still there, still going strong. Six sides, it rotates around as a unit, and any little clouds that get trapped on the outside, just it's like cars on a racetrack. They zip around faster than clouds inside or outside. It's a six-sided jet stream. The South Pole doesn't have one. Jupiter doesn't have them. It's very unique to Saturn's North Pole, and we're still puzzled about why it's there and what's keeping it there. But other planets have dipoles. So on Venus and Mars, we've seen dipoles. These what do you mean? What, what is a dipole? So this is like has, has six, it's a wave number six wave that's traveling around the North Pole. And in Mars and in Venus, you see a wave number two going around the, the um, poles. And so uh, many, it, we even see that on Earth from time to time. Sometimes Earth has a dipole as well. So it's not that unusual to have a, sort of a standing wave, but this hexagon is particularly pretty. Hmm. The planet, the, in, the interior of the planet. I mean, we wanted to know what's going on at the core of that planet, right? Has Cassini helped us to understand uh, the structure of Saturn? I think the grand finale orbits, those 22 orbits in between the rings and the planet, bring us closer than ever before to get detailed gravity measurements, magnetic field measurements, and there have been surprises. For instance, the magnetic dipole and the spin axis of the planet are almost right on top of each other to 0 0.06 degrees. Hmm. And we were looking for a wobble that would help us get the length of Saturn's day. But so far, it's just perfectly lined up. The interior of Saturn is not what our models predicted. We're not sure what it is, but it's not what our models predicted. So we'll have some interesting information about how Saturn formed. You know, does it have a small core, you know, Earth-sized little core? What's going on inside of Saturn? So give us another six months or a year. We're getting closer. Earl, when that grand finale started last April, and that mm -hmm. first dive between the rings and the planet, how nervous were you? I, I was uh, nervous. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably an eight on a scale of one to 10. Um, we had really put everything we um, knew into the, um, the models. We had never seen this, that region between the planet and the rings, and we could only extrapolate based on the dust that we had seen, and we, we thought it was benign, but we really had no idea. And um, so, you know, and of course, the spacecraft, for our first plunge through, we used the shield of the high gain antenna into the oncoming dust, just in case it was even worse than we thought. Uh, and we didn't call home for some, what, eight hours later? Twelve. Twelve hours later. So it was twelve hours of, 
of wondering, and then what we really were waiting for was the call home, and it was either going to come home fine or, or not. And I was very apprehensive uh, because we'd, we'd staked everything on, the, on this being a clear passage. Uh, in hindsight, we were as wrong as we possibly could have been. Not only was it not dusty, uh, not too dusty, it wasn't dusty at all. All the dust had been eroded down to nanoparticles. So we were able, to, at that point, to completely retire any contingency plans we had about using the high gain antenna as a shield. And my relief was <laughs> uh, very palpable. But, but Julie, you did get pinged by a few of those nanoparticles, right? No, no. Oh, you did we, not. Uh, uh, the the mm -hmm. radio and plasma wave, the, the one that has the three antennas, which you know, would go if it if it if it felt a particle, they got nothing. Well, the particles were so tiny that when they did hit the antennas or hit the spacecraft, they weren't big enough to make an electrical signal. Right. That's so right. they were there, but benign for Cassini. Absolutely. But but that was probably the most nervous time for Earl and yeah, I that in the in the last three or four years mm -hmm. was that April event. That was that, the one yeah. I had to be re reminded to breathe. Except for that eight, that eight meter per second burn. <laughs> 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 we were, we've been watching the gas gauge for the last two and a half years, and uh, we did one big burn, and we were all, we had everybody at the rating in case we ran out, because we were going to have to turn around and, and try to finish that burn up on these little tiny thrusters. Uh, and when that finished, I was also really, really relieved. But just, just one more in this section, and it goes back to something that Jacob told us about the rotation of the planet, how long is Saturn's day? Sounds like it would be an easy thing to figure out, right? Not so much, Linda? No, if you look at Saturn, you're just basically looking at clouds and gas. And so it, the clouds rotate at different rates. The different bands go faster or slower. What we're looking for is the internal rotation rate to pin those cloud speeds down. But we don't have it. We thought we had it with Voyager. Turns out it wasn't what we thought. We're still looking. All right, I wish we had more time just to talk about the planets, uh, the planet and the rings, but of course that's not just, that's not the only thing the Cassini mission was about, the planet and rings. It was about Saturn's moons as well, in particular Titan and Enceladus. When the spacecraft launched in 1997, attached to it was something called the Huygens probe. Remember, it was Christian Huygens who realized that Saturn had a ring, but he was also the first to spot the moon Titan. Titan, by the way, is the second largest moon in our solar system, 50% larger than our own, and lingering questions, as you heard from the panel, about Titan from the Voyager mission was a major reason why we sent Cassini back. The goal of Huygens, of the Huygens probe, was actually to land it on Titan's surface to find out what was going on there. But that's hard to do when you haven't seen the surface before. See, Titan, as we also heard about, and as you can see, is covered in a hazy orange atmosphere. It's made up mostly of nitrogen and methane. So scientists didn't know if they were going to land this billion dollar probe on a mountain in the middle of a mud flat or in an ocean. And they didn't know if it was going to sink, crash, or land safely. So for a bit, the team watched Titan from above through Cassini's camera, and in the winter of 2004, they went for it. Cassini and Huygens, who had spent seven long years together adventuring through space on a grand quest, had to say goodbye. They gave each other one last look, one last long embrace, and detached. <laughs> Huygens' descent to Saturn, to Titan, excuse me, had begun into the orange haze, taking pictures, analyzing the atmosphere and the surface below, reaching out to Cassini with crucial pieces of data she was gathering on her way down. And what she saw was magnificent a landscape nearly a billion miles away that looked a lot like Earth. It had rivers, it had lakes and mountains, but this is space, things are crazy. Those rivers were made of methane and ethane, and the mountains were made of ice. Huygens parachute deployed, and she drifted down, sent landing safely on a mud flat. All told, Huygens transmitted data back to Cassini for about four hours or so. After that, Cassini's friend was gone forever, stranded on Titan, but we learned a lot about one of the most mysterious moons in our solar system, including the fact that it might contain precursors to life. 
So with any luck, maybe someday there'll be a little fence around uh, Huygen sitting on the surface. <laughs> for it'll be, it'll be a photo stop on the, uh, right. the Titan tour. Um, we've got a couple more images of Titan. Uh, we'll bring up the first of those. Linda, what, what are we looking at here? How was this captured? This is an image or a series of images from the Huygens probe. And here you can see those river channels where liquid methane flows and carving these channels in a very similar way that water would carve channels on the earth. And then you see what might be like a, a dry lake bed with the channels flowing into it. And it was just amazing with our first glimpse of Titan's surface to see these kinds of features there. So this is the right audience to make this connection. I saw these images for the first time also when I was in um, at, at the European Space Operations Center. But I want you to look at that photo and look for the Los Angeles River emptying <laughs> into the Pacific. You see the Palos Verdes Peninsula down there. It is so familiar. And then you have to work very hard to remind yourself that this is an entirely alien place. It's so frequently foggy like that off of the Palos Verdes Peninsula. <laughs> yeah. uh, I know it well. Um, all right, look at this next absolutely gorgeous image. It, doesn't that look like something you've seen flying over the American Southwest? Linda? Yeah, it's just beautiful. Again, a series of images from Huygens. The camera was taking pictures as the probe rotated around, and then they put them together into this uh, series of very beautiful pictures. And that's what the, the color of the surface looks like. We actually carried a little lamp. As we got closer to the surface, we could turn it on and use it to calibrate then what we were seeing. Earl and Julie, engineers, how impressed are you that the European Space Agency was be able to build a probe, a craft that could do this? Are you going to tell the story or am I? Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goody. <laughs> they built a great spacecraft. They, made, they built a great probe, but they forgot to put Doppler correction in at the bit level. And so Cassini and our navigation team took the first two orbits of, of Saturn made it into three orbits, so Titan one and two became Titan ABC, and um, we actually dropped it, so we changed the way we flew by Titan so that we could get the signal back clearly, and we started looking at that in 2000, and it took us uh, uh, two years to actually figure it out, figure out the trajectory, change it, and then do all of the, orb the, the correction, the course corrections along the way. So I wasn't seeing the pictures. I was seeing the downstairs in a basement of an ITL testing <laughs> <laughs> sequences. So, so was there ever a chance that you were not going to get the data Absolutely. back Absolutely. from Morgan? Absolutely. 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 There's, there's a great story of, of human persistence here. We, we launched thinking that we'd done all the appropriate testing on the ground and that Huygens didn't need to be tested again. But there was an engineer from the, uh, on the European side that absolutely insisted against great um, resistance from his management, his uh, both unit. personal and professional, that we would actually test it in flight. And so he brought the equipment to the Goldstone tracking station. We made Goldstone look like a descending probe and we tracked it with Cassini, which is exactly how the, the data was supposed to do. Cassini tracked and recorded the data from the probe. It didn't go directly to the Earth. So we looked at the data, and um, they said, we had a great test. We'll get back to you. And it was several months later, it was, well, the test wasn't quite so great. Uh, <laughs> we've got a serious problem. And we quickly formed a, a nice team, but it was, and, and got the problem solved. Uh, it's a long story and, and rather, rather subtle. It's not, a, not, a, not, a, not an easy, easy thing to catch. But it was the persistence of this engineer that just absolutely said, we must do this. Never, it's again, just don't give up and test, test, test. Uh, and otherwise we would have been sitting there um, on January of 2005 with nothing. He sat in the base of, of one of the Goldstone antennas and hooked up his computer. So it was one Goldstone engineer and Boris um, hooked it up and sent bits. And uh, his management truly insisted that they didn't need to do it. And when he did, it was it was it saved the mission. Yep. Wow. I, I was told that it was similar, uh, and this might be uh, breaking it uh, too simple, that it was similar to someone turning it, tuning into like 89.9 .9 instead of 89.3. 
Like something. <laughs> is that is that a little too? Simple just to pick some frequencies that, randomly. Yeah, just a, just. That's what I heard from a scientist, a real life scientist. Huge mistake, obviously. Yeah. If they hadn't fixed that. I don't know. Well, no, um, but ninety-one point five. But it, that's it. It really is a little. It's 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 the right idea. Uh, there are so many different layers of Doppler compensation and locking loops inside these receivers. You're talking about minuscule signals that have to be very precisely timed in order to get above threshold. And it just was a very subtle error. And unfortunately, what happened was that the designers, a lot of times, you, you put these in firmware so you can change the settings. This was hardwired in. Wow. And so the only thing we could do was change the trajectory of Cassini. Huygens had to do exactly what it had to do, but we could move Cassini further away. And fortunately, there was enough margin in the link connection that we could stay some 60,000 kilometers away and still track the probe going and, in. And not yeah. only that, but the navigators managed to do it, as you said, by replacing two orbits with three. And in so doing, that meant that all the science planners didn't have to change That's any right. of their science plans for the remaining however many uh, dozens of orbits they had already begun doing their science plans yeah, for. So that right. really saved the science team's That's bacon. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And yeah. it was I, I fair to say that, it, uh, you know, Huygens, as we've probably heard in the past, is has come to our rescue back in 94. We were, uh, we were slated to be X'd out of the budget uh, by Congress, and I've got the letters from the, the, the community in Europe that passion, please, to not do that, and indeed that was exactly what happened. So we were very happy to reciprocate. <laughs> <laughs> has, this, has it paid off? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. No doubt. This is exactly no where Many I was hoping, over. this yeah. is where I was hoping we would go, because this was an international mission. ESA came up with Huygens. Uh, but the Italian Space Agency, I don't think enough people know about uh, the role that they played. Well, that's well, right. They yeah. built the antenna. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the antenna, the high gain, um, is, is a unique, it's not just any parabolic antenna. It's a five-frequency antenna. It's a very specialized um, the design and, and antenna. And there's a lot of radio. There's a lot of diplexers and, and, and combinations in, inside to compensate for keeping those frequencies separate. Now I have to laugh because you take that antenna every time you go through a dust hazard, you point the antenna right yeah. at the dust <laughs> you're hazard. Right. <laughs> you're right. It's, it's sturdy. They, it's they still the best. Yeah. <laughs> they, also, they also built the image, the visible part of our MIMS instrument, the visible infrared mapping spectrometer, as well as significant components of the radio and radar systems. So their contributions were significant throughout the And, and Gal scientists Galileo Officiant built the stars. Right, we, Star we paid for those. <laughs> oh, we <bought laughs> those were not Aussie contributions. <laughs> we actually paid for them. But yeah, they're Italian components other than their contributions that were part of just the international uh, contrib uh, you know, components of the spacecraft. Mm. We're going to move on. Um, yeah, actually, there are a couple of other questions that I wanted to ask you, in fact, about Huygens um, and their ability to complement each other. Yes, Huygens save Cassini, and later Cassini would save Huygens. How did having both of these uh, result in better science? Well, Huygens provided ground truth. We knew what the landscape was, the, the composition of the gases coming out of the surface. So we had one point on the surface we knew very well. And then with the rest of the mission, we could use the radar, look in the near-infrared, and map the rest of Titan and put it in context with this one point from Huygens. So that was very valuable. And also as we went down through the atmosphere, ground truth also for the composition of the atmosphere, the pressure, and the, all of the things that, that Huygens could do uniquely on the surface. Yeah, the atmospheric density, which um, the, the engineers and the scientists came up with different type densities at Titan because we used the thrusters and, and, and the scientists were using INMS, the, the mass spectrometer, that got the last data at Saturn. And we had a we had a huge factor difference, and you know Huygens provided the ground truth on that one too. Mm. That you know if if the if the map in your eyes aren't right, you know the the map's wrong. <laughs> and I think you know Cassini's remote sensing ability, notwithstanding, it's still Titan's atmosphere is still really good at cloaking the planet and making it difficult to understand what's going on on the surface. I'm still dubious, for instance, about claims of active volcanism on Titan that are made from the orbiting observations, but when Huygens landed and saw rounded cobbles on the surface, there is only really one way to take 
some chunky broken thing and round it, and that's to roll it in a fluid. And so that to me as a geologist is incontrovertible proof that there really is liquid rolling across the surface to make mm. those channels. And so there's there's really nothing you can to replace that. Huygens was amazing at what it, at what it showed right. us. Right, we actually watched it rain on Titan. Parts of the surface darkened. You can imagine like a desert thunderstorm and then slowly that surface dried up, seeing lots of clouds and weather. And what was really nice in the beginning, the North Pole, there was like a a lot of clouds and, and very thick covering. And then there's the seasons change and the sun came up. It's like those clouds kind of parted and we've gotten really wonderful views of these large lakes and seas at the North Pole, sort of rimmed with some kind of interesting material. We've been watching to see if there would evaporate, no change in lake level, looking for waves on their surface, evidence of wind. So the clouds did kind of part in the north and that was, that was really nice. It's only now that I'm thinking, boy, I wish we had brought along an image or two of this. But talk about that mysterious island that comes and goes. Oh. <laughs> we call it the magic island. <laughs> sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. And it turns out there are several places that have these features. We're not sure if it's maybe bubbles coming up, uh, something just beneath the surface. We just see it in radar. But they, they tend to come and go, and we keep looking. and and haven't exactly figured out what they might be. I, I like th the person who told me, oh, they're cryo-whales. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like speaking, speaking of which, I don't think there are any astrobiologists up here on the stage. Maybe we have some in the audience. But I know astrobiologists who are actively considering how life could exist in this frigid place, beyond frigid. Obviously, it wouldn't be life as we, as we know it. Um, do you find this line of research interesting? Uh, Linda, I guess you, go I, to you I find it very intriguing. Could you have life that could use liquid methane in place of liquid water and have the chemistry that you need? It's cold there, it's, it's not as efficient to use methane compared to water, but there is a possibility. And there have been calculations by astrobiologists and it would be very intriguing, very interesting to send a boat into one of these Titan seas and make some measurements to see just what you find there. The seas are really are very deep on Titan. The, uh, the, the seas they're, are they're shallow. How deep are the seas on well, Titan? Well, we've bit done bathymetry, and we know that some are about a, there's over a hundred meters on one of them that wow. actually. So they're they're not just shallow ponds. They really are. I think we've likened them to the volume of the Great Lakes. Right, it's about yeah. the same depth of the Great Lakes, about the same size as the Great Lakes huge, tremendous volume of methane. And this was something we didn't know we could do. We, we bounced the radar off the top surface of the lake, got a really strong booming signal. And actually this uh, young person who had worked on some other data looked at it and said, look, there's a second signal. I think it's bouncing off the bottom. And sure enough, we could uh -oh. then map the bottom of the lake and see how deep it was and how much methane was inside. You already mentioned the speculation or the, the proposals that have seriously proposed a boat to go sailing on the seas of Titan. Um, I got a great t-shirt that says Surf Titan. Um, <laughs> but there are other proposals as well. Earl, what would you like to see go back to Titan? Well, I think, I think the boat is, is clearly one, but I, I think the, the edges of those lakes is where I would want to see something going on, something that could actually you know, the, it's, I have no background in astrobiology, so I'm free to speculate wildly without any <laughs> repudiation of my professional career. But I think that what, what's, what's going to happen is, is going to be at the edges of those, at, on the shores. We've watched this odd sort of, uh, as the lakes come and recede, some, some coloration changes and some structure changes. So I'd like to actually see something that could spend time at that fringe. And... Uh, I put in a plug for my robot buddies at JPL. We've got the technology. It just needs to be operating in very cold. But that's where I'd like to go. So. Julie, I've heard... I'm okay. sorry, go well, ahead. I was going to say, Titan is an aeronaut's dream because it has a relatively thick atmosphere. It's, th it's about the same density as Earth, a little bit denser, but the gravity is much lower and the atmosphere is much taller. So you could take, say, a balloon or some other kind of fairly simple gliding um, aircraft. And you know, if you were human there um, in an in a appropriate spacesuit, you could take like little wing-like device and just flap around in the atmosphere. It would be wonderful. So some kind of flying thing that could go up 
catch a trade wind, go down, sample the surface, rise up again, and just kind of dot all over Titan and take pictures would be lovely. Julia, I was just talking to somebody ta who was talking about a quadcopter, like a, 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 drone a drone that so many people now own. Really? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's a, a mission proposal in New Frontiers to fly a quadcopter on a Titan. A quadcopter on Titan. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll volunteer to be the one on the surface with the remote. We'll go. <laughs> we'll go. You know, just, just tell me how to get there. Yeah. <laughs> what um, else you want to do? <laughs> so, so far we haven't gone, we've gone below the surface of that, those seas, but even deeper down, we've learned that uh, Titan is a world of multiple oceans because yes. if you go deep enough, right, there's a water ocean. Pretty incredible. Linda? Exactly, a liquid water ocean underneath Titan's icy crust. We wonder if there might be a connection somehow to the surface. We know that methane needs to be replenished because it's broken apart in the top of the atmosphere and over time it would disappear. If all the methane is gone, Titan's atmosphere would collapse. So something, some process has to keep releasing methane. Maybe it's with water with some ammonia like an antifreeze and it can carry methane up. We're not sure of the process, but we know it has to get replenished. And, and this is a discovery by Cassini, right? The confirmation of that water ocean below the ice? That's right, with the Cassini gravity measurements. With the radio science, yeah. yeah. And also, the I think the radar tracked features on the surface, and you can see the whole crust of Titan rotating a little bit on top of its lubricated mm. ocean water layer on the inside. Well, it turns out that uh, Titan isn't the only moon of Saturn hiding a, a warm and inviting ocean that might be able to support life. Jacob? <laughs> it's not all about Titan. There's also Enceladus. It's a much smaller moon right in the middle of Saturn's E-ring. So, but what you really need to know is that it's actually a perfect little snowball floating through the cosmos. Titan was weird in how Earth-like it was, but Enceladus was weirder. See, when it was initially spotted in the 1980s or so, scientists were able to figure out that it's always covered in a fresh coat of snow, like powder, stuff you could ski on at Big Bear, not during a drought year. But there is no atmosphere, there are no clouds, there's no snowstorms around the moon, yet there's always this fresh powder. So the question was why? Well, Cassini went for a trip to try to figure it out. Passing by Saturn, it eventually arrived at Enceladus. And when it got there, it spotted something unexpected and magnificent. Giant geysers of water shooting out of the snow and ice, 50 miles into space at supersonic speeds. Cassini was able to actually taste some of the mist, and it turns out that it was really salty. It was actually salt water shooting out from this moon a billion miles away. Scientists use that data and other measurements to figure out that there's likely a global ocean beneath the crust. And there's a giant heat signature on the South Pole, which is actually boiling water, pushing it up through the ice and into space. All told, they spotted 101 geysers, and Cassini made another miraculous discovery. Because beneath all the ice, there's possibility that the Snow White Moon could be harboring life. Before we go on, I mean, haven't these little multimedia segments been terrific? I want to thank Jacob for presenting these. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Okay, here's another uh, image that uh, Emily has provided. It is another gorgeous one of uh, those geysers spewing out of those so-called tiger stripes. Emily, did you have to work to get these to stand out? There's, um, you know, Cassini has amazing cameras, and they're much more sensitive than the cameras that you and I have. So when a lot of what you're seeing here is really very faint light, um, but then Enceladus is a very bright surface. Like Jacob said, it's very snowy, and so it tends to reflect light very brightly. So you have to work to kind of combine images, uh, parts with different exposure levels in order to make the geysers pop out and see all the detail in them while also being, being able to see detail in the surface. But you know, Matt's giving me credit for processing these, but I have to give credit right back to the Cassini imaging team and to the navigators and to the uh, engineers who built such an incredibly stable spacecraft. The images are so <laughs> crisp. <laughs> All I see is seven target Enceladus. Say, say that again, Julie. 
all I see is seven target Enceladus <laughs> comma offset, you know. <laughs> but it but it is. It's the it's the stability of the platform itself on the spacecraft that allows you to build these kinds of images and take them over and over. Take long exposures. Take long exposures. Pull out that subtle detail. And it, and it was easier, right, Earl, with Voyager, because Voyager had a little movable camera platform. You had to move the whole spacecraft. Right. Well, there's there are two, two sides to all those stories. And one of, as, as Julie has alluded, is that when you bolt your Hasselblad onto a brick <laughs> <laughs> and don't move it, it is incredibly stable. We had an early experience with the spacecraft. It was so stable that we actually burned out a pixel on one instrument because it was had the star right on that pixel for 20 minutes. Uh, but once we figure that out, it's just it's phenomenal. Now, of course, the, the downside to that is that when imaging wants to go to Enceladus, so does everybody else. Uh, <laughs> that's the, uh, but, but again, to come back to the, the, the team's ability to collaborate and share, uh, we got the best of both worlds. Yeah, I think what Julie's alluding to is originally before Cassini was de-scoped, we had a scan platform on one side, a turntable on the other for the fields and particles, a movable radar antenna, yeah. and it was really an incredible machine, so you could do a little of everything every flyby. But with the de-scopes, the scan platform disappeared, the turntable disappeared, the extra antenna disappeared, and you now had this lean, mean machine but a very stable platform for pointing. And you would have had only the half the number of instruments because you still had the same amount of power. Mm. So I, I still... Yeah, I, I think I, it, overall, I think it ended, it, given 13 years and a chance to spend the time that you needed, uh, then, then we got back the science we had lost by we, taking these we, off. We had a wonderful, very capable scan platforms pointing in all directions on paper. <laughs> But the, the reality of that system never really sunk in as both being operable and implementable. And I think we, again, reality set in and we got, I, we got a good one. I, I, think, I think reality really did set in because that would have, uh, we would have been out of fuel a long time ago. Uh, right. So I, I really think that and the body fix, man. And some of incredibly subtle images, you know, when you've got a scan platform, there's always motion compensation and so many different mm -hmm noise factors that have to be in the, the we've, 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 we've been shed of, and that's, I think, given us a tremendous insight. There's some observations, I won't get into them, about Enceladus's mutation that I'm not sure we would have been able to do without having a, 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 a scan platform, with a scan platform. Mm. Right, and it took 10 years of observations to look for this slight wobble that led to the fact the ocean was global and not just at the South Pole. You mean Pole. of Enceladus. Or of Enceladus, Pole. sorry, of Enceladus. Yeah, 10 years of observation. Emily? I think it's it's worth, uh, with these, these images are so kind of otherworldly and cosmic that I think it, it's worth taking a moment to try to imagine yourself on the surface, what, what you would see. And you can see the geysers against the blackness of space, but if you follow the line, you can see them go onto the night side of the planet. And so if you were standing there on the night side of Enceladus and looking up, you would not be able to see the geyser in front of you on the ground because it would be dark, it's night but you'd be looking up into the sky, and at some point, the sunlight would be coming across and lighting up the geyser way up above your head. Right. Yeah. And so that would be pretty cool, too. Quite a light show. Yeah. yeah. Linda, why only the South Pole? Why coming from these tiger stripes? Uh, that's a good question. We think that had the geysers, or these fractures start anyplace else, it would naturally move toward one pole or the other. But why just the South Pole and not the North Pole? We're not exactly sure, although we know the crust is thicker over the north, and maybe it's too thick for this water to get through from the ocean. Mm. So one hypothesis is that if you look at uh, Enceladus's next door neighbor, Mimas, it's a similar sized world with an enormous crater on it. And perhaps um, another, uh, Enceladus received a big whack. Actually, every single one of Saturn's satellites, icy ones that you look like, has a great big crater on it. Enceladus doesn't. And maybe it got a big whack at some hot spot on its surface that, that got this kind of runaway process of melting an ocean and everything going, and over time, the entire crust of Enceladus rotated to place it at the South Pole because of Enceladus' spin. It's quite a story. Earl, Jacob, oh, go ahead, Jacob. Can I, why, why the hot spot, though? <coughs> what is the mechanism behind that? Well, we think that the reason Enceladus has the ocean is that it's in a resonance with Dione. It makes its orbit slightly elliptical, egg-shaped, that allows Saturn to sort of be squeezing on it like you'd squeeze a ball, and that heat energy then keeps the, the ocean liquid. 
but why not Mimas? I mean, that's another puzzle. Why not Mimas? Mm. Uh, Earl Jacob mentioned that by flying through the plumes, Cassini was able to taste them, mm -hmm. meaning how? What well, instruments? Well, the, there are two instruments that are able to actually analyze the particles I in situ. One is the ion and neutral mass spectrometer that can break them apart by their molecular components, and also our cosmic dust analyzer is, has the ability to, uh, to, to uh, do some chemistry on, these, uh, on the components. And uh, I shouldn't say, they can't do chemical experiments, they can only break them apart and decide what they're made of. Uh, but, and both of those we have used to advantage on Enceladus by flying through the plumes themselves. Uh, it was, uh, we've been closer to Enceladus, but uh, I think it was 2015 we yeah, did it? we were actually closer, but we were closer. Yeah, but we actually went through the plumes. The plumes. Yeah. And that was yeah. a bit of a, a dramatic moment. One of the uh, videos <laughs> you showed actually showed some kind of snowflakes hitting on the windshield. That may have been a little bit of an artistic <laughs> license. But there was some, <laughs> some concern that, that we might have some particular particles there that, that might cause us some harm. But there's no way to, I mean, to fly through the plume and use the high gain as a shield would have been just a complete waste. Yeah. So we, we took that chance and uh, the risk was fairly low. And, and it was, um, and, we, and we did. We started out on thrusters at about 175 kilometers and then slowly realized that we weren't doing any thrusting, there, there was no resistance, and then we slowly worked our way down to 25 kilometers on reaction wheels. So the stability of the picture is being able to get close. Do you want to explain why, uh, what the distinction is between using reaction wheels and using thrusters, why you have to use thrusters in some situations? Well, thrusters you, you use to turn faster or to go incredibly fast. You, you use it for, for, for turning fast and for fighting the atmosphere. We use thrusters at Titan. When we, when we go below uh, about 1,300 kilometers, we, we fight the atmosphere with the thrusters. If we go above 1,300 kilometers, there's not enough atmosphere, and we can hold the spacecraft stable with the reaction wheels. Mm. I have to pile on to that incredibly fast comment. <laughs> watching Cassini yeah. turns like, is like watching the hour oh, hand okay. of a clock. <laughs> 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 you're moving, hour hand. You're moving yeah. many yeah. tons with itty bitty controllers. <laughs> and so when we go rapidly fast with the thrusters, it's about three times that fast. Yeah, well, so. okay, all right. It's 30 <laughs> minutes to do a 180 minute turn, or yeah. 180 degree turn. Yeah, it, it so is. Linda? Is and what was so incredible about with Cassini, we actually seven times flew underneath the South Pole, directly sampling the gas and the particles to reveal the ocean, the organics in the ocean, excess hydrogen, tiny nanograins of silica, these tiny grains could only form in water that's near the boiling point, telling us there might be hydrothermal vents on the seafloor of Enceladus. And so tantalizing, you have the water, the energy, the food, the organics. Could there be life in this very intriguing ocean? And but you also had, um, you had caps. You had the, the mid-range, the plasma spectrometer through Enceladus 17. Right, right, to see the larger particles, yeah. And so not only is this a promising environment in which life could form, it has all the ingredients, the chemistry, the liquid water, the solvent, the, the energy from the hydrothermal vents, but it's so politely spewing its ocean into space where it's really easy to scoop up. Free samples. Free samples. Yeah. So, you know, maybe there are other places in the solar system where other people are convinced that might be more likely to have life, but there's none that's easier to sample than this one. So you, you found organics but not complex organics, because you just couldn't, right? That's right. The instruments on Cassini were not designed to look for life. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't find the amino acids, the fatty acids, the long chain molecules uh, that would be created by life. So that's, that's for a future mission. So that's why we need to go back. So, yeah. so would you bet on it? Would you bet that we would? What, do you, what are the odds? Oh, you I, I think odds? the odds are pretty good. It's just yeah. a question of what takes that, what's that initial spark to get life going? Yeah. It's worth a look, that's for sure. Let's yeah. jump to Saturn's neighbor, Jupiter. With any luck, in the early 2020s, the Europa Clipper will be leaving for there, and I believe it will be able to taste those longer, more complex molecules, perhaps, of life, right? That's exactly right. It has the mass spectrometers with the range, like maybe four orders of magnitude more than Cassini has to do just that at Europa. It's just a matter now of finding a plume 
and flying through it. Now, there are signs that Europa could have plumes, kind of like Enceladus does. The problem is that Europa is much more massive than Enceladus. So those plumes don't travel nearly as far into space. And so it's, uh, it'll be much more difficult to find those things, um, which is what makes Europa a little bit harder to target than Enceladus. But it's also a lot closer. But and plus, you've got that, that horrifying radiation environment at Jupiter. <laughs> Earl, would a mission like Europa Clipper work well for Enceladus? Uh, would it in some ways be easier? Yeah, well, other factoring in the fact that uh, Saturn's so much further away, yes. Uh, but Enceladus itself isn't, what, what the Europa Clipper is able to do uh, is to use Europa to effectively move itself around and, and interrogate or investigate Europa on all sides. Enceladus would be a little bit more challenging for us because it's so small that shaping the trajectory to go around to the other side, you know, beneath and around the way we've been able to do a Titan. So there'd have to be some, some astrodynamics done with, with Titan as well. Exactly. But a Titan and Enceladus one-two punch, I mean, what could be better? I mean, it's what we, what we try to do, and to go back and do that even more with even more sophisticated instrumentation would be perfect. We've got two more images of Enceladus. We don't have to say much about them. Uh, I just want to show them because they are so <laughs> beautiful. beautiful. What is it? Which yeah. So that one's Dione, actually, um, and three oh. of the little ring moons uh, I think we up jumped against forward. the rings. Go, yep. uh, yeah, yeah, there, there we go. go. That's also not Ence that's also Dione, actually. <laughs> My mistake. Sorry <laughs> about that. It's a lot of beautiful because moons. we did want to give. We can't give equal time to mm -hmm. the other moons, but yeah. there are what sixty something. There's There's quite sixty-two. Quite a lot. Yeah. Sixty-two <laughs> moons. And all these little ones have, have their own personalities. But I think one of the things that we learned from Cassini is how connected the entire system is. I mean, all these mid-sized icy moons, Tethys and Dione and Rhea, their surfaces are painted with ring material that's been accelerated in the magnetic field and implanted, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, on the back sides that's right, of these the moons. Yeah. Yeah. So it's um, all, you know, they're, they're individual worlds with their own histories, but they're all connected to each other in the right. system. Through the E-ring, through the material from Enceladus that spreads out through the system and coats the, the far sides or the back sides of these moons. So how much of the E-ring is Enceladus responsible for? Enceladus makes the entire E-ring. It's thickest wow. at the Enceladus orbit, mm -hmm. but it spreads all the way into the rings of Saturn and all the way out to the orbit of Titan and it can get charged up and it's very extensive this way as well. So a very water rich, E-ring rich system. Mm. Where can people go to find more, many, many more images like the ones we've been looking at tonight? Well, Emily? I'm glad you asked, Matt. Well, you can go to <laughs> the Planetary <laughs> Society's <laughs> website at planetary.org, follow the links to the multimedia and the Bruce Murray Space Image Library named for one of the founders of the Planetary Society. One of the things that I do at the Society is I try to corral images that have been processed by this huge international community of people who are thrilled and excited about images from Cassini and all of our beloved space robots. And you really can't find um, a larger collection of those things anywhere. I'm very proud of it. It's, it's far from just me. There are so many other people who are much better at this than I am and produce amazing pictures. And it's not that the scientists can't produce these things. They certainly can. Just that when science process images, they're, usu they're usually trying to um, increase the contrast, trying to look for subtle features, trying to understand, of course, the science that's in the picture. But the amateurs and the enthusiasts, they're trying to answer the question, what would it look like if I was there? And so you get these um, unearthly and yet still familiar images that would look like they would appear to your own eyes, and it's just incredible. Do any of you in the purple shirts want to get uh, equal time for a JPL site? <laughs> well, I, I do want to just, <laughs> just follow. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more with Emily. The, 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 the amateurs and semi-professionals that have been processing the data from Cassini have done a phenomenal job, and we do share some of those on our website, <laughs> <laughs> saturn.jpl.nasa.gov. Again, all the raw images are there in their very raw form, as well as some of the science-enhanced images. And we also have given some, some form to the amateur images because they really are spectacular. And the patience and precision that, that Emily and others have, have, have put on these images are just, I think, spectacular. So uh, it's both places. Right, in <laughs> fact, Emily was one of the first to put out Enceladus setting behind Saturn. She very quickly got those raw images, put them together into a wonderful movie I think beat anybody else out there. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm not the best, but I'm the fastest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, first, first, is, first is good. Our time has flown by, but we have to ask, what's next? That's a um, good question. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we've given some hints at other missions, uh, going to Titan, going down to the surface again, um, getting back to Saturn, but there's so much more that we can do. Is there anything do. we can look forward to in New Frontiers that well, you can the, give us hints yeah, about? Yeah, the, the New Frontiers <laughs> program that uh, Jacob mentioned, there are actually five missions. They are competing. There's a group of 12, and five of those are to go back to Saturn. There are two Enceladus missions to answer the questions about the ocean, look for evidence of life, two Titan missions, an orbiter and a quadcopter, uh, a, Saturn, a Saturn probe mission, and then, uh, so there's five chances. In December, we'll hear uh, w which of those, th three of those will make it to step two, another year of proposal work, NASA will down select to one. Uh, and there's also other ideas out there for joint missions with the Europeans. Maybe we could do a, a Saturn probe mission with the Europeans where Maybe we build the probe and they build the orbiter, for instance, or the spacecraft that carries the probe, or how about uh, Cassini 2 and 3 to go to Uranus and Neptune? So I think there's a lot of uh, potential, but it might be decades in the future, though, until we get back. This is the part of the show where I need to stand up for the underrepresented planets. I would like to see New Frontiers go to Venus, finally, because Venus is so neglected, but there are such wonderful targets at Titan and Enceladus. And I also think that we need to keep in mind that Uranus and Neptune are both going through their equinoxes toward the end of the 2040s. And that's a period when you actually get to see both poles of all the planets and their moons. And so I'm hoping that we can plan in the long term and get perhaps a pair of spacecraft, identical spacecraft that would be out there exploring both of those distant worlds. And so they're, hoping. they're very different worlds, these ice giants mm -hmm. from the gas giants and that we've been looking at with Jupiter and Saturn. And yet they're very similar in size, at least, to the majority of the worlds that we've been discovering orbiting other stars with all of our exoplanetary missions. So, so look a close look at Uranus and, and Neptune. You're looking actually at thousands of planets, That's right. millions maybe, across our uh, across the Milky Way galaxy. Earl, what would you like to see happen next? We'll, we'll stick to the outer solar system. Well, as I, I have to say I, I'm still kind of want to stick with the plan. Um, as <laughs> wonderful as Cassini has been at Saturn, I, I think that we need to keep going. Voyager has, has shown us, has teased us with Uranus and Neptune. They're long missions, but we have the capability, both in propulsion and, and in, in the instrumentation, to get there in, in our lifetime still. <laughs> I'm probably gonna be uh, on the couch watching TV, but I would like to see us continue <laughs> to, to, to keep that going. We get, there's, a, there's a strategic view of exploring our system, and at, at the same time, we wanna be tactical and, and, and these, use some of these smaller missions for, I think, the, you know, to go back and, and look at Enceladus and Titan, but, but not lose sight of the big picture. Julie, where do you want to go? Well, I'm with Emily. I kind of, you know, I, my first spacecraft was Magellan. And, at Venus. And, at Venus, so I, I would like to go back to Venus. I, you know, I, of course, I, I like to say that we, you know, at one time in 1991, we had a better map of Venus than we did of the Earth. So maybe we did <laughs> such a good job, we don't have to go back. <laughs> no. <Yeah. laughs> no, I'd like, I, I'm, I'm really rooting for, uh, is it Psyche? Uh, no, that's, that one's a, a no, metal that, asteroid that's, mission. That's the yeah. asteroid. The metal one? Veritas, yeah. yeah. I'm, Veritas. I'm really hoping to go back to Venus. How about the three of you personally? Where do you go from here? Let's start with the engineers. Uh, are, you, are you done, Julie? Well, Earl says I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Earl, Earl, Earl thinks I owe him an engineering report. <laughs> he knows what kind of writer I am. Um, we, we've got an, we've got, I've got 20 years of engineering to break down and, and write about. And uh, we, we don't write papers as well as the scientists do, so we've got a lot of catching up to do. Oh, you can't see them. They're laughing because Emily's shaking her head. It's, yeah. it, it's really true. Yeah. You know, we, yeah. But, but the tension is gone. Absolutely. Uh, the tension... We like that I don't want to say the thrill is gone. <laughs> yeah, so. no, we like that tension. We like the tension. I, I yeah. think a month after not being called in the middle of the night, I'll 
I'll be out looking for another job. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> I, I've got to get that right report for her really fast. <laughs> but I think, you know, I think both of us have been pretty myopic about what's next, just trying to get this done properly. And now we, we, we make some jokes about paperwork and things like that, but I think by, you know, after the holidays, we get ourselves documented up, I think we'll be looking around and we'll see what we find. <laughs> Linda, yeah. you, speaking for the, you uh, yourself and the other scientists on the mission, you're far from done. Right. We have another year's worth at least, year's worth of funding, but far longer to actually look at and try and understand all of the Cassini data, in particular the 22 orbits from the grand finale. And I have some data in there too. I work with the composite infrared spectrometer. There are some beautiful ring scans that I'm looking forward to diving into the data looking at these things called C-ring plateaus, these thicker regions in the C-ring and greater, higher resolution than ever before. And I'm also on a proposal, one of these proposals for New Frontiers, it's called Enceladus Life Finder or ELF, to go back to Enceladus. And so, who knows, maybe in December I'll be one of those three working on another proposal. If not, I'll root for whatever mission uh, NASA puts. And what now, about, oh. Sorry, I, I was actually going to ask about you guys. Are, you, yeah. are the citizen scientists going to keep digging through everything Absolutely. that's come back? And you know, the, the Cassini mission was very generous to share those raw images on the internet, but they were actually kind of a cruddy version of the data set. They were not calibrated, sure. they were squashed down with JPEG compression, it was kind of gnarly. And so now my hope is that I can encourage more of the amateurs to go into the NASA archives, use the real science quality data, because there's so much more subtle detail available in those images than anybody's been able to appreciate from the, the raw JPEGs. And so my goal, I think, is to encourage more people to participate in that kind of image processing. Linda, do you have uh, an idea offhand of how many papers have been based on Cassini data? and how many PhDs have been achieved? Well, well we have over 3,000 science papers so far. Wow. And I'm sure in the next year and in, and in the decades to come, there'll be far more papers and books. We've literally rewritten the books about Saturn and Titan and the rings, and probably dozens of PhD theses. I don't know the exact number. And those will continue as well with this very, very rich data set. So just as you were uh, a fairly young scientist, a PhD, when this got started. It's a good way to bring the youngins up. Oh, absolutely. I've had some wonderful postdocs that have worked with me over the years. In fact, my very first postdoc is now the project scientist for the Huygens component of the Cassini mission. I tell them, I'm so proud of you. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> we have sadly reached the end of the evening. I want to thank all of our guests for being here and excuse the four of you. Please help us thank Planetary Society Senior Editor Emily Lakdawalla, Cassini Mission Manager Linda Spilker, Cassini Mission Program Manager Earl Mays, and Cassini Mission Spacecraft Operations Manager Julie Webster. And that is along with the 5,000 scientists, engineers, and others who have made the Cassini mission one of the greatest voyages of exploration ever. And we'd like to give a special thank you to Caltech's Beckman Auditorium for hosting us, NASA and JPL for all those wonderful images you saw up on the screen, KPCC's in-person team, the Planetary Society. Thank you to all of you and to Matt. It's been, it's been fun. Thank you. Before you go, we have a special treat from a local band. The Amoeba people, they make great music and they love science, so it shouldn't be surprising that they have created their own tribute to the grand finale. Uh, the band will be performing at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles uh, this coming weekend for Dino Fest, so they get to all of the sciences. I think some of the band members are here tonight. Um, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Saturnians and Titans, here is the Amoeba people's Cassini, dive, go. Good night, everyone. Clear skies. Thank you.
Take it back, back to 1997 when Cassini left the earth for good. With the one way ticket for a seven year journey bound for Saturn and its neighborhood. Destination, the jewel of the planets had to leave the earth far behind. But little did they know the success of the mission would leave it in such a bind. Cassini found water on Enceladus, man, our faces turned a little green. It was scheduled to orbit at infinitum, but now the risk was much too high. So one last dive through Saturn's rings, then it's time to light up the sky. Oh! All done, and the data's collected. Enceladus will need to be protected. When, when the mission's all done, and the data's collected, Enceladus will need to be protected to avoid contamination and the risk of pollution. A grand finale is the only solution to avoid contamination and the risk of pollution. A grand finale is the only solution. Only solution. Yes. Only solution. Yes. If that's so, let's put on a good show. Oh. 